to this afternoon's second issue briefing on scaling social entrepreneurship. My name is Oliver Kahn. I work at the World Economic Forum. Welcome also to our audience watching online via Facebook and via weforum.org and all those other channels. Um, now we're here to talk about social entrepreneurship and not just to talk about it because we've been talking about social entrepreneurship for quite some time. We know it's a very valuable and, and valid and, and increasingly relevant um, part of the puzzle when it comes to solving complex and critical challenges. Social entrepreneurs have a, an agility and an innovative potential and a, a reach that makes them valuable where businesses and governments are not. So the question we're asking today is following a, a, a summit of 200 social entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs and, and, their, and their cohorts and, and colleagues in other communities of the World Economic Forum on scaling social enterprise. What can we do to take the great work that social entrepreneurs are doing and amplify it so that we have a multiplier effect and we improve the lives of more and more and more people. We know we have, we have great ideas, we have great people, so what can we do? What is the next stage? This is a very short session, it's 30 minutes long, and we need to keep as much room for exchange and questions as possible. So I'm going to talk for, very much, uh, for, for not very much longer. Um, I'm going to answer, introduce my panel first of all. Patrick Giyama Awua, Jr., founder and president of Asheshi University College, Ghana, social entrepreneur. Uh, Toby Norman is Chief Executive Officer of Simprints Technology based in the UK and Tracy Gilmore is Co-Founder, Chief Operation, Operations Officer of the Clothing Bank here in South Africa. Patrick, let's start with you. Tell us a bit about your business, first of all, and perhaps what you've learned this week at the Solutions Summit. Well, I, I run a, a, a university in Ghana, a private not-for-profit, and our mission is to educate ethical entrepreneurial leaders in Africa. By sort of the very nature of universities, the work that we do kind of ripples out through our graduates. So we have graduates who are out there who are already touching millions of lives on the continent in the work that they do. Uh, however, one of the things that we've realized that we need to do more of is to collaborate with other universities and in particular share our model with others. What we've done is we have these majors in, in STEM and management, engineering, computer science, business management, but they're all layered on this liberal arts core curriculum that teaches critical thinking and problem solving and gets students to think about ethical philosophy and so on. And we have students go out and do community service and they sort of develop empathy from doing that. Results of that have been phenomenal. We don't see enough universities in Africa using this approach. There's a lot more um, rote learning and narrow learning in terms of discipline. And we think that there'll be value in us sharing our model with others. So we will be of service to others. And this is our sort of our next systems change project is to develop an institute on our campus where we invite other universities, uh, the leadership, academic leadership, but also institutional leadership to come and um, join us in a collaboration in a community of practice to learn from each other. And we'll share as much as we can with, with others and hopefully learn from them as well. Why do you think it's taken so long for, for new educational practices to become embedded in African education? Well, education is something that countries do um, and have been doing for decades and even centuries. And just by an education, the educational systems are often the largest systems operating in countries. Right? The, the educational system, if you think about from kindergarten through high, higher ed, is vast. And so it has this inertia just from the mass of it, how big it is and how long it's been running. And I think that sometimes people are a little hesitant to experiment too much with such a large system. So what we offer to a system like that is that experiment, you know, in a smaller institution, trying something new, seeing that it works, and now hopefully you know, we can share it with others and they can see, well, this is not such a risky experiment. Uh, it's not such a risky thing to do because we've seen it work at Ashesa University. 
Uh, and just one more question before we go to, to Toby. What's been your key learning from, from this week at the Solutions Summit? Well, I've been really struck by uh, the passion and intensity with which my colleagues work. And uh, our first day, we did a session uh, really talking about personal challenges and the work that we do. But I've also been very struck by the fact that uh, we are actually moving the needle. And that when we collaborate with each other, uh, we really do multiply our efforts. Uh, and so th that's a key takeaway for me. It's been sort of a confirmation of what we were planning to do at Ashesi, that if we're really trying to achieve systems change, we think about scale at a country level. Scale is going to happen from the government and from the market, um, not from individual institutions. Uh, and that what we can do, if we, if we can influence government and if we can influence a market, then we will achieve tremendous scale of a particular approach. And so I, I'm sort of moving forward a little more confident than maybe just a few weeks ago. Which governments are you confident about talking to? Well, I'm going to be talking with uh, the government in Ghana. Uh, that'd be a natural one. But we're inviting universities from other countries as well. And so what I see could happen is that some of those universities will adopt this model. And then they'll be able to talk to their governments. They're closer to their governments. And so it's, we can sort of ripple through the system in this manner uh, and really see a sea change uh, in the next uh, few years. So Toby, Patrick's been talking about education, something human beings have been doing for hundreds if not thousands of years. People have been searching for an identity for hundreds <laughs> if not thousands or millions of years. But what, again, what you're doing is quite new in helping them do this. Tell us about Simprints. Sure. So Simprints is a technology social enterprise. It came out of research we were doing at the University of Cambridge. And basically what we do is we work with governments, NGOs, businesses who are delivering services, digital services, whether it's education, healthcare, wherever. But they're often stumbling at that block of identification. For their poorest beneficiaries, I will very rarely have actually formal ID, won't be registered with the government. And so if I'm a healthcare worker, let's say working in, in rural Uganda, and there's a child in front of me and that child has no birth certificate, no formal ID, how do I look up their vaccine history and know what's the next vaccine in their course to give them? So Simprints solves or contributes um, to solving that identity challenge through biometrics. Um, so we've developed, uh, we manufacture and we create biometric technology with hardware and so software that allows you to look up that child's records just with their fingerprints. And again, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question I'm going to return to. We're here in Durban to talk about scaling your business. It's quite new, I understand, yeah. anyway. But uh, how are you going to take it forward? And what have you learned this week which may influence that? Yeah. Well, the key to scale in our sector is to work with the partners who have actually achieved scale or are genuinely achieving scale. You know, the size of the problem is massive. The World Bank estimates 1.1 billion people worldwide lack any formal identification. That is a huge demand. That's a huge challenge. You are never going to get there by yourself as a social enterprise, just growing organically and slowly trying to solve that problem. So what we need to do is find the right partners to work with. And I think what I've learned during the Solution Summit of the past couple of days is some of the tools that you can build those coalitions of support, build those partnerships. And there's technical aspects to that, the way that you build data interoperability, you get privacy and data security right. But there's also political aspects to that. And those are sometimes the most challenging and the most thorny. Getting all the partners around the table lined up on, we, this is a huge problem. How do we solve it together? How do we align the incentives in the right way that everyone's interest is in getting it fixed properly? In your experiences so far, because you touched upon a very important point, you need collaboration from government as, as, as well as business. What have you learned about the limits of social entrepreneurship? Because we've heard about the potential, and I want to go back to that at some point too, because 1.1 billion people, that's a yeah. big addressable market. But what are the limitations you found of, of, of your organization up till now? Yeah. I think there's a number of limits to social entrepreneurship. One of the ones that we feel quite keenly is that as a social enterprise, you're sometimes perceived as like a halfway house between sort of the public sector, so services that the public, should be public sector should be providing. 
versus sort of the private sector in terms of its commercial model, its financial sustainability, its operations. And people sometimes perceive you as a halfway house of both. But if you're going to be really effective, I, I don't think it's a sort of a mix. It's not a mishmash in the middle. You really need to be as effective as commercially and sustainably as the private sector while holding yourself to the impact standards of the social or public sectors. And that, I think, is really challenging. It creates new challenges in what you need to measure and taking those measurements really seriously. It creates new challenges in the way you think about finances, which models are actually going to work. And if they're not going to work in your organization, how do you at least build a coalition of organizations to help you solve that so that financing is there? It's nearly impossible to solve these large challenges alone. What kind of interest have you got from the, from the, the private sector? As I said before, it's huge, right? 1.1 billion people. I imagine there's lots of technology companies would love some help in addressing that yeah. market. So this is where I think social enterprise can be an incredible catalyst in this space, because in some ways we can take risks that the private sector can or has been slow to. So for example, in our space in biometrics, biometric technology has been around for a long time. You know, the application here is, it seems quite obvious as a way to solve this identification gap. And yet the private sector for 30 years hasn't built technology that's cheap enough, that's accessible enough to actually solve this problem. And so I think as a social enterprise, what we can do is we can shock the system. We can access capital the private sector can, that we can take high risks on in terms of R&D. We can push new technology out there. And we can also not just prove the technical model, that this is technically feasible, but the operational and commercial model. And I think if we do that, if we lead that way, the private sector will watch. And if they see you building something that's cheap enough and cost effective enough, they will follow. Because if they don't, we could potentially go after their markets. That's what I like to hear. Aggressive, aggressive moving uh, into new markets. <laughs> Tracy, I'd love to hear a bit about your inspiration and your, um, your, the, the, the drive that you felt to get involved in the Clothing Bank, as well as a little bit about the story of your organization. Thank you. Um, the drive to get involved with the Clothing Bank was that we really feel very passionately about unemployed women. These are women that have been left behind, they're undereducated, they have limited opportunities. So we realized that there was a huge amount of excess stock to be found within the retail supply chain. And we tapped into that supply chain and we used that stock as the tool to teach unemployed women how to run businesses. Because we don't believe you can learn to run a business in a classroom. You've actually got to get out there onto the field, make some mistakes, have some successes, and then start to trade. Very early on we realized that just an income generating opportunity wasn't enough. We actually had to address the whole woman. So our program is very deep and we run um, a training program where we teach business, finance and life skills. And we do a very deep coaching and mentoring program. There's also counseling available to her. And it's amazing to see how the depth of, the, of um, the support she gets helps her on her journey. So after the two years with us, she actually can go out and run a completely separate different business and still sustain herself because she's been restored. So her self-esteem is in place. The children have been taken care of. They're getting educated. And it really, it really is a, um, a wonderful to witness that transformation taking place in a human being. And of course, like, I hesitate to suggest, all of us in the room, in this room here, in this building, we'd like to see as many people helped as, as possible. How do you envisage scaling your business yes. to do that? So that's an interesting question because we are constrained by the supply. So the retailers aren't wanting to give us more than they need to of the excess waste because they, it's only 1% of their turnover and obviously they would like to reduce that ultimately. Mm -hmm. So it really is a very much a metropole model um, and how we can replicate it is to take our training program and share that with other organizations and other institutions because we've seen how that really works. They would need to have some kind of an income generating opportunity to marry it with our program and mm -hmm. then we could replicate that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's almost the, the core business itself is just a, it's a vehicle Yes. For the, for, the, for the training? Yes. Happy to take any, any questions from the floor. We have some businesses in the room as well, some private sector. I'd love to hear if, uh, any thoughts on the uh, appetite for working with social enterprise. One thing which keeps me um, awake from time to time is wondering whether you guys are getting the support you need mm -hmm. from various sectors. Patrick, you said yourself, it's, it's government, it's um, Toby, you have... Um, you know, uh, issues getting private sector on board. They're not producing kits cheap enough and, mm -hmm. and, and quickly enough. Are you getting on people's radars more as a, as a community? And, and, and do you think there's a, well, what is the direction of travel for social entrepreneurship? What, you've been in this space for a bit of time now. Do you see it evolving in any way? 
Patrick, let's start with you, because you're okay. nearest to me. Right, <laughs> okay. Well, um, a Chassis University has been running for 15 years, and um, we've gone through a lot of learning, as you might imagine. When we first started, it was very difficult to get uh, funding, to get financial support. But that was, I think, largely because we were we hadn't proved ourselves. We, we, were, we were very new. Nobody really knew about us. And, you know, when you're going through that phase, it's really important to be very, very focused. For, for me and for my team, we had to build, a, you know, develop a business plan that really we could see from point A to point B where we sort of get in the black and we're breaking even. And in between that, we had to be sure that we were demonstrating the power of our educational model, that actually students were, we were getting the outcomes that we needed, we wanted to get from our students. And so we paid a lot of attention to career placement. Uh, the first class was 100% placed in jobs within three months. And every class after that, we've met a, our goal of 90 to 100% placement. And, and then when they go out there, people see that they perform at a different level than their peers from other universities. And so when, when we face those kinds of funding constraints, that just focuses more on proving the model. And then once it was proved, we're able to gather a lot of support, um, which is where we are. And, I, and this is one of the reasons why I'm optimistic that, you know, as Toby said, the thing that we do really is we take a risk in trying an experiment that others are afraid to try. And when you take that risk and you're successful, I think that sort of attracts support. And I think it's now also going to attract uh, people copying our model. And it's up to us to be open to that in sharing with others. Attracting competition, exactly. And it goes back to the work you're doing, Toby, as well. How do you how do you do you see that? Do you do you, do you feel the competitive threat there? Do you need feel the need to, to keep innovating? Is it more about changing and diversifying mm -hmm. your model, or is it a matter of just there's so much work to be done just yeah. addressing the, the, the core business? I think when you operate in an environment of market failure, uh, lack of competition is actually the problem, right? Because if you don't have competitors, you are the only one telling the story. You're the only one convincing the, the market that there's a market here. There's a technology that can solve this need. There's a genuine need and there's commercial potential. And as you start to bring in competitors in some ways, especially in the early days in markets that are still forming, they really help you. They help tell that story. They help widen and define the edges of the market. So I think for us, we're quite excited about it. And that's something that we've only come to after being talking to our fellow social entrepreneurs. Um, one of the advantages of being part of a community like the Schwab Foundation is that you get to see similar challenges, even in totally different verticals, that your fellow social entrepreneurs are facing. And that's something very exciting for me, and I feel more optimistic after sort of seeing that play out in other fields. It definitely makes us want to work even harder to actually bring more players into this space and get some competition going. Competition welcome, it's good to hear. Uh, we've got a question from the gentleman there. Can you remind us who your, who your name is for the benefit of our audience? Yeah, I'm, I'm Norbert Kunz, I'm a social entrepreneur from Germany. You're part of them with your answer of my question already. But maybe you can make two or three exep exceptions or exemptions. Example, sorry, example of what works and what not works in the cooperation with, with the private sector. And how do you convince the private sector to work together with you? Sorry, is that, who's, who's that addressed to that question? All of them. And, and yeah. it's very noisy. Apologies for that. It's about the private sector and convincing them. Yes. Right. Tracy, would you like to start with that one? Sure. In South Africa, um, all the corporates are incentivized to adhere to a broad-based black economic empowerment scorecard. And we are fortunate that that also incentivized a lot of our donors to, to donate their product to us. So they can earn enterprise development points on their scorecard. However, Having said that, I believe that if the scorecard wasn't there, we would still get those donations. Because people have the will. They want to see equality, inequality being tackled. So, yeah. Anything to add, Patrick? In, well, in, in our case, uh, working with the private sector was sort of natural for us. We're a university. So we went to the private sector, not just the private sector, actually social sector, government, and asked them, what should we be doing? What are the skills that you need to see from our graduates? 
and we made sure that the curriculum we developed was going to address the needs of the private sector um, and others. Uh, now, they then took a, an approach of, let's wait and see if it works. Um, and as we started to demonstrate performance, it has gathered, you know, the people in the private sector who have signed on to mentor our students, who come and speak in our classrooms, who offer internships in their companies, and now increasingly also offering scholarships to students. And so for us, it's been sort of natural because we reached out to them in a very proactive way uh, before we, we did anything, and we made sure that we're meeting their needs. Any more questions? Yes, lady in the second row. Thank you. Hello, Emma Hastings, Global Shaper from the Stellenbosch Hub. Um, as a profession, I'm a youth development worker. So from the side of somebody who works with youth on a day-to-day -day basis and motivating them um, to really explore their potential, how would you encourage us as people working with youth on the ground to encourage young people that social entrepreneurship is an option and it is an option that they, that is a viable option, it is an option that um, they, is an acceptable and a respectable um, line to take because it's, it's not something that people talk about. Um, I, as a South African, I can only speak from my experience in South Africa, it's not, people talk about entrepreneurship but not social entrepreneurship. Um, so from that point of view, youth very much have a self-centered view on where they're going. It's about where they are going, not where they are taking their community to. So what can you as social entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, what do you feel you can actually offer to people on the ground working with youth to make show, show social entrepreneurship more of a scalable option for youth? Because you need question. the youth in order to make it scalable. It's about the, the talent pipeline, isn't it? And, and what right. are you doing to make your profession sexy and interesting for all those young people out there? Tracy. There is actually, a, you know, do you know Wine Big Boys in Wine Big Cape Town? The every, Wine Big Boys, yes. Every year they, they invite social entrepreneurs to come and talk to the boys between, I think it's grade 10, 11 and 12, and they have a whole day around um, social entrepreneurship and everyone presents their model. So I think more of that could really help, going at a younger age to show the, the different options before they actually go over to university. And I think Patrick also has the answer to that. We, we were actually chatting about it this morning, saying particularly youth in South Africa, I think are quite selfish. And I've got three sons myself, I know. And um, yeah, that model can really help. Yes, yeah, so one of the things that we do is uh, there's a requirement for all our students to engage in uh, community uh, service. And so they take the skills that they've learned as students, um, they identify a problem in their community, and they apply those skills to solving those problems. And the, the process of going through that, first of all, shows them that the things that they're discussing in the classrooms are not merely abstract, but real important issues. They learn, uh, they gain a lot of empathy from doing that work, and they also gain a lot of confidence from doing that work. And what we find is we now have, you know, graduates who go off and they start as social entrepreneurs. There's some that will start in corporate or will start their own business as for-profit entrepreneurs. But, but even for those who are in corporate or who started companies of their own, we find that they start to reach out quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I was blown away uh, a couple of years ago in 2015. I was at a conference um, in, at UNESCO in Paris. And, you know, they had, you know, all these global companies that, had, that were contributing to UNESCO to help children. And there was this young company that had been founded by Ashesi grads that had attended that conference and had made a contribution of $10,000 to UNESCO. And I could see people really surprised that here were young Africans coming to Paris to contribute towards a social cause. And they were for-profit entrepreneurs, but the thing is when you when you've achieved, when you've seen the impact of your work, you see how very rewarding it is to actually reach out to others um, and to assist others to advance in the world. So that's the approach that, that we take. 
Do you have anything to add to that? I'd just add, I think, as you're much a, as possible. You're a cold tech company. <laughs> Talent pipeline problems. <laughs> I think I'd just add, showcase where you can actually quite how exciting this work is. You know, because right. it really is, it's an incredible career and it's an incredible vocation. You get to have all the ambition, the sort of the growth, the potential of the best of enterprise, yet you're doing it for a purpose. And I think finding those role models is essential, showcasing those role models, creating the empathy. Um, but don't forget, you know, they're youth. They want to be excited. They want to be engaged. I am stunned by the talent that comes knocking down our door saying, you know what, I, I could go off and do the traditional routes, do corporate, do consulting, do the rest of that. But actually, you guys are having an impact. I'd love to come work with you. So if you can show them how exciting this space is, I think you'll find some real engagement. Great stuff. Well, we're coming um, mercilessly to an end of this session, sadly. I do want to put one question to each of you first, because you guys are the stars. You're the guys who are doing it where businesses can't and governments can't. We're in a meeting of over a thousand leaders from politics and business and civil society. We've got about a day left. We've got about 24 hours left. What one outcome would you like to see achieved? I'm not just thinking about social entrepreneurship. I'm thinking about the wider, the wider world here. Think about Africa. What would you like to be to see achieved at this meeting? Let's we'll start with you, Patrick. Well, um, you know, uh, the last few years, there's been a major change in the world in terms of the reduction in poverty. And China was a big part of that, lifting 800 million people out of poverty. It's a phenomenal, uh, it's a phenomenal phenomenal thing that they've done. I think that for this continent, uh, the single biggest job for us is economic advancement. That we need to grow economies across a continent to provide jobs for people, to provide dignity for people, to prepare people for a world that I do not know. I don't know what the world will look like 30, 50 years from now, but we, we need to be working in a way, as Professor Schwab said this morning, that we need to be acting as trustees for the future. Uh, and, and so I think that this is a really big project and we all need to put our shoulder to the wheel and push very hard. Toby, same question. I think in a place like this, where we're seeing such a speed of technological change, you know, and thrilling and exciting, but fast and sometimes scary speed of technological change, I would strongly encourage the policymakers, the private sector players, the social entrepreneurs, to push hard now for fair, open standards when it comes to data, to data privacy, security, and consent. Because if we get these things right now, we can create an ecosystem where this technology does real good. But if we fail to do that, then I think we're also going to set ourselves up for some real problems. The private sector will trip up on itself. There will be failures of data privacy, data consent, data protection that I think are going to leave people behind or potentially going to hurt people. So this is the place where you have those players in the room to make that happen. And I'd strongly encourage people to take that conversation seriously now because this is the moment to do it, not in five years' time, not in 10 years' time, not when something bad has happened. Fantastic. Tracy, so you're, you're from South Africa. Where is South Africa? It's our home in Africa. What would you like to see achieved at this meeting? You know, I'm a very practical person. So I would really like to understand what inclusive growth actually means. What are we going to do around that? You know, it's wonderful to be with captains of industry and academics and learn from the research, but I really want to practically understand what that means. What do we need to actually physically do? A wonderful question, of course. It's a, it's a, it's a you know, the basis of a lot of our intellectual research in the forum. We've done a lot of research, and just the benefits of those that aren't aware, we, uh, the Inclusive Growth and Development Report, launched in Davos this year, provides a whole new model for economic development. And it boils down to changing the way we measure national accomplishment and thinking about median income, living standards, not top-line growth. And we've done a lot of work on it. It's by no means complete. Um, but it, this is what we mean by it, but it has different connotations and different understandings. So it's a, a fine question. And I've, I've heard that question asked a lot this week as well. So hopefully, and I'm with you on this one, I hope we get to a closer definition by uh, Friday afternoon. Great. This has been a wonderful session. I uh, really thank you for joining us and, and, and uh, wish you all the best. And 
hope we can have more scaled up success stories in the future meetings here. Well, thank you for joining us, of course, here in the room and watching us live online. This session is now over.